but roughly speaking if you imagine the gulf of kutch in india at the rounded bit at the tip is dwarka just off it is bet dwarka and there is a river gomati which runs to the mouth yeah. of the place where the, uh, the where only dwarka thing is, is the way when you zoom in on the gulf of kutch there's a little bit of it's like a bit concave it is it swoops back on you Yes, which is not a pattern when you see the full size map of India, but when you zoom down, it's kind of yes, is going backwards in yes. a way. Yes, yes, only nuance. So, uh, this is what I wanted to show you that Dwarka was not a very simple place on the mainland. It had mm. an intricate system of creeks and rivers and ridges because it was absolutely on the coast. So that mm -hmm. was the point I wanted to make by showing you this map of. एंशंट द्वारका एंड एंशंट बेट द्वारका हाय एवरीवन वेलकम बैक टू द वाक इंडियन हिस्ट्री पॉडकास्ट आई उत्कर्ष नमस्कार सुमेधा वेलकम वेलकम टू ऑल लिसनर्स ओल्ड एंड न्यू Yes, and again, I know I sound like I'm repeating myself, but thank you for the response. You know, we we are getting a lot more engagement uh, with the last few videos. I think we are finally some more people are getting aware of us. So thank you for that. If you are doing some something to spread the word, and we are getting such good questions and such good comments, it's really it's really encouraging. That's true. That's true. Very encouraging, and uh, it makes me feel as though you know I'm uh, part of something bigger than both of us. that's a desire for knowledge amongst the public in general and we are both just part of that stream yes and curiosity as well knowledge and curiosity about about our past yes and when, in the world's smoothest segue i think there are a few things that <laughs> indians are more curious about than a certain word starting with d with d dwarka <laughs> Yes, yes. You, <laughs> you know, know almost <laughs> uh, all the questions and engagement that I got for this because I asked for questions, it was all on Dwarka. So I was thinking of some other cities, etc. But right now, today is going to be Dwarka. Maybe later we will definitely do other submerged cities. But today, Dwarka and one more, which is actually equally fascinating. But do go ahead, Uttar. Yes. So. as you said right if original intent let's talk about ancient cities lost cities submerged cities um they say the people have spoken so the people have said let's talk about dwarka yes so let me tell you what my questions are and we'll get a lot into the audience questions and we cover everything i think together there are so many different things the first question obviously is is dwarka a story or does it exist right because there is you have both sides of the spectrum you have one side that says oh god this is a myth like atlantis briefly mentioned by plato in some where or whoever it was i'm forgetting on the other side we have all the you know we have the ruins we have the underwater finds so what do we really know what do we know from modern evidence what do we know from texts uh, i would love for you to get into that as in a usual typical walk into history evidence based approach that's question number 1 question number 2 is there is definitely a linkage with our text with the mahabharat specifically so i'm very curious to know what is the story of dwarka according to the mahabharat and how does it kind of correlate with what we see so let's start there and i'm sure once you once you share that i, I think there's going to be plenty of food for thought yes of course of course so you know it's exciting and when i get all these questions like i was saying i go back and read things and immerse myself in uh, the past it's an amazing experience for me too so right now i have been kind of uh, swimming in the sea along with our marine archaeologists and seeing a lot of things and reading the mahabharat and the harivansh and the bhagavat puran it is a crazy amazing interesting mixture so to start with because we are an evidence based podcast the evidence for this episode is all going to come from marine archaeology it's just you know mm. archaeology underwater uh, uh, under the sea under rivers on the shore and it's a very special uh, aspect very special type of archaeology which in india started in the 80s with someone called sr rao and it's a lot of sr rao's work that we will be delving into today because he single handedly established this then there is a nio t in india in goa 
the National Institute of Ocean Technology. Okay. So they are the ones who do all this stuff. But you know how marine archaeology actually became so interesting for people? It was because of the Titanic. Of it course. Because, yes, the Titanic was raised. And in fact, you know when you said you've been swimming was. in the sea, I thought about that uh, that submerged thing that they have in the beginning of Titanic, that they go down all the way. Oh, Tash, so... can I let you into a secret? I've never seen the film. And I don't know anything about it. So I just know that probably uh, the real thing. I just I know nothing about the film. Okay, probably the only person in the world, but sure. <laughs> yes. Okay, that's a confession. But then uh, there's so I haven't seen Avatar for that matter. So I'm not a popular culture person, but forgive me for that. So anyway, to go back to our own uh, submersions, why is it important for us? Because we have a huge coastline. We are a peninsula. Yes. We are a huge coastline. And a lot of our early, early civilizations, whether it be the Saraswati Sindhu civilization, or even later in the first and second millennium, a lot happened along the coastlines. And uh, if you remember, I have uh, often remarked in these podcasts that the, this coastline, the Indian Ocean, the Arabian Sea, the Bay of Bengal, it is the crucible of the earliest cultures. If you remember, once we had done the Indian so Ocean is it, littoral. Is it the coastline or is it along the river? Uh, also the coastline. Rivers, okay. yes. Rivers, yes, as well as the uh, coastline. If you uh, look at some of the oldest civilizations and you look at the Indian Ocean littoral, you will find mm -hmm. almost mm -hmm. all of them over there. So anyway, that's uh, the reason why we are interested in underwater cities, apart from the, you know, fascination and interest mm. of something which was on land and then because the sea rose and swallowed it up we don't know of it anymore so mm. we could have had the most magnificent amazing cities and civilization and we don't know of it at all so that's the fascination of uh, underwater cities we have many many underwater cities because you know uh, contrary to what is thought we were a trading seafaring nation right from the word go and uh, i don't know whether we'll have time to talk about it now because we are going to be concentrating on the gulf of kutch where the mm, uh, mm, dwarka mm. and bait dwarka and river gomti complex exists but there is oh. also a gulf of khambat and in the year 2001 while checking for pollution the niot found perhaps the oldest civilization in the world 7,500 Gulf BCE. of Khambat. Where is Gulf that? Gulf of Khambat. So India has two gulfs. The top one near the run of Kutch is the Gulf of yeah. Kutch and okay, the lower one it. is the... Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. The lower one is the Gulf of Khambat. So that Gulf okay. of Khambat is uh, today arguably evidence of the oldest cities, urbanization and civilization ever. Today may not be the day for it, but we will definitely do okay. some uh, mm -hmm. uh, focused... Uh, I do a focus podcast on what has been found in the Gulf of Khambat. Okay. But uh, to come back to uh, Dwarka and to the Gulf of Kutch and to the run of Kutch, all this appears to be reclaimed land. And all this appears to be very much closely connected with the coastline, the sea, which is the Arabian Sea over there, as well as a river which has now almost disappeared. This river, no, it's not the Saraswati Utkarsh, in case you were thinking I'm going to say that. Who wasn't <laughs> thinking that? <laughs> no, <laughs> it is not. Although it is also connected with Dwarka, I'll tell you why and how. This is the river Gomti. So Dwarka was on the mouth of the river, river Gomti, where the river Gomti fell into the sea. So it was at the tip, it was behind it were hills. It was at the mouth of a river and exactly where the river fell into the sea. I'm saying this twice because remember it. This is the description of how seaports should be made, location where seaports should be made according to our old own manuals. And I'll give you one guess as to which manual says this, Utkarsh. Which manual do well, I keep referring to? Us, All the us, time. Yes. Yes. But, but it's that's not, not that old. old. Yeah, yeah, that's true. <laughs> so what I'm going to tell you is that the remains are much older, but we can find yeah. theoretical evidence of the way they were designed. This was called a dronumuk. Even in very much later 
Uh, books. Yeah, Artha Shastra is definitely uh, not uh, 2000 BCE, which is the date which has been found for the Dwarka settlements. So uh, shall I start with the story in the Mahabharata and then go on to how do we know that the remains that we find, the place that we find is Dwarka, which is mentioned yeah, in the Mahabharata. Yeah, I think that's a good approach. We start with what is the I won't call it evidence. I, I again, I'm not an archaeologist. But what is the, what is written in the text? What is there available? What is the story? From, what is the story? What is the story? And then let's go related to what we can confirm today. Yes. With the, whatever method. What we is have. the story? If we know the story, then we can see. We can move on to Dwarka and Beit Dwarka and see yeah. what are the connections. And then we see hmm. what has been found over there. Yeah. And then we see what are the connections hmm. with the you know uh, Saraswati Sindhu civilization. Yeah. So, uh, in the Mahabharat and in the Harivansh Puran, the Harivansh Puran is kind of like an appendix to the Mahabharat, which gives the whole story of Hari. Hari is Lord Krishna. Mm. And also in the Bhagavad Puran, which is one of the 18 Mahapurans, it also gives the story of, uh, Vishnu, uh, of Vishnu's avatar, Rishinji. Then there is also the Vishnu Puran. So, all these are the sources from where we get stories about Krishna and Dwarka. But Krishna is associated with Mathura, right? With Vrindavan. That's where he was born. That's where he uh, did his Ras Leela with the Gokis, where he fought with Kans and where he killed Kans. So what's all this about Dwarka? So that's an interesting story in itself because it was Krishna's killing of Kans which forced the Yadavs to move from Mathura towards Gujarat, which is the... Uh, Gulf of Kutch. Today we call it as Gujarat. Mm -hmm. At that mm -hmm. time, it was called Kushasthali. Now, Kans was the king of Mathura who was killed by Krishna. Kans was also Krishna's uh, mama, his mother's brother. And I'm sure our listeners would know that Kans had heard a voice telling him, uh, Bhavishyavani, <coughs> which told him that the son of Devaki, his beloved sister, would be the one to kill him. So he had imprisoned Devaki and Vasudev and he used to kill all their children. Krishnaji miraculously escaped, grew up in Vrindavan and then came back and in a fight he killed Kans. So that's a long separate story. Yeah. But what happened was that Kans was married to two daughters of Jarasandh. Now, Jarasandh was a very powerful king of Magadha. And he could not tolerate this, that uh, Ugrasen had been put on the throne instead of Kans. So he attacked Mathura. And he attacked Mathura, Krishna and the Yadavs fought and tried to save themselves. They withstood 18 attacks. After 18 attacks, the 19th one, some of the allies of Jarasand also started making arrangements to fight and to attack Mathura. So then the Yadavs decided that it is a, you know, discretion is the better part of valor and that they will move from Mathura somewhere else where they can be safe from Jarasand's anger and Jarasand's revenge. So where did they try to think of going? So they had a very, very old ancestor long back. His name was Kakudmin Raivat. He had gone to Raivatak Parvat in a fight with some other people and then he had set up a city over there. Where is uh, this uh, Raivatak Parvat? It is in Gujarat. It is what we know today as Girnar. In fact, it is very close to Dwarka. So they decided that they would go to that ancient ancestral city of theirs and build a very protected fortress where they could be safe from the ire and anger of Magadha. So, you know, that's why another name for uh, Krishanji is called Ranachod. He ran away from the field of battle. That's why he is also <laughs> called Ranachodji. So, you see, we have uh, all uh, the characteristics of our uh, Devis and Devtas and different names. So, anyway, mm. uh, the entire Yadav clan relocated to this place near Girnar Parvat. And this is important because that is the way it is described, that they went to a place, Revatak, which is uh, which was uh, near uh, this uh, Girnar Parvat. It was called Revatak at the time. And they established a seaport over there. 
they established the seaport at kushasthali and uh, kushasthali is actually a place called bet dwarka so you see there is dwarka which is called antardweep in the mahabharat and it's also called varidurg in the harivansh and there is bet dwarka which is called kushasthali a uh, kushasthali or bet dwarka is a little island utkarsh since we are on zoom do you think that it's a good idea to show people that place if yes uh, but the question is oh you're sharing the screen wonderful how good so can you see the this is just you yes. know you can see it's wikipedia can you see dwarka i can see ha uh, here's dwarka and can you yeah. see bet dwarka here is bet dwarka uh i see so my screen is not large but i'm confident that when it's on a computer screen it will be large enough but yes okay so it's a little island in the yeah. middle of that little cusp over here and when i uh, can you see my uh, uh, this arwa dwarka so the river gomti also comes from the south and falls over here and look at this okhamadhi okhamadhi is also important all these places just you know note their relative position Relative so bet dwarka yeah. is an island off the coast of dwarka and dwarka is on the mouth of the gomti river as well as the arabian sea so this is uh, uh, it, it's good to get the location mm. of all of all these places yeah. so they came to dwarka and uh, this place was the bay you see there was a little bay where you were uh, looking at bet dwarka that gave you very good protection from the weather and it was it was there was a hill at the back there was the sea on all sides so what they did was that they made a seaport at dwarka and uh, the bet dwarka place was kind of like an administrative head it was their capital you can put it like that okay and it was overlooking the arabian sea and uh, it was built at the interface of land and sea there are also two or three creeks how long did this take actually i you know mahabharat of course the battle itself was a few whatever 18 days but and there are many things preceding the battle how long was this process to set up something so well for that we only have kind of miraculous version so they uh, krishna ji was helped by the uh, architect the divine architect who is called may and vishwakarma who is a divine artisan so it was built like that it was built in a trice all the houses at the speed of may was it built at the speed of may <laughs> no no i think uh, two or three days <laughs> two or three okay. days not more than that wow so uh, uh, i think that, i think that i need to we need to have a separate conversation on these on these uh, things concepts of time these, or what not concepts of time or the more miraculous things that happen but let's not distract this episode okay uh, miraculous things which happen you know uh, i just like to i mean uh, just a little word the little yeah. word is that uh, it is they are kind of metaphors when the text says that it was built in a day or very quickly i mean it's just mm. to tell you that it was done quickly or they will say that it took you know yugas many yugas went by while this happened it's a figure of speech it's a figure of speech in okay. some cases but not in all cases in some cases it is a figure of speech in other cases it is not which is why it makes things a little uh, more difficult Mm-hmm. and uh, it makes things a little more uh, difficult in terms of interpretation mm-hmm. uh okay, okay. but uh, what was there at uh, in this area was also there were also some people over there who used to uh, be very bad uh, pirates etc etc so they were subdued with the help of devi ji so uh, they always come to the defense or to the help of all our hmm. heroes all our epic heroes so hmm. with the help of uh, with divine help so to say all the people who were undesirable and pirates etc they were removed and this bet dwarka and dwarka were established over there 
So, okay. uh, how do we now, how do we know one that this is the Dwarka that is being described in the Mahabharata? So yes. That's also a question, isn't it? Although, yeah. just to tell you that uh, in the Harivansh Puran, there is a description of Dwarka, which is described as an island which is released by the ocean near Raivatak. So, if you were to, if I were to, you know, go into details, but I showed you Dwarka just as a dot. But if you were to go into great details about Dwarka and see what it's like, let me see if I can show you something else. I'm going to show you something else. Do you mind if okay. I share my screen again? Please. I mean, I only feel like I'm back in office, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, yeah, I know. No that's one why has, I was hesitant. No one has shared the screen with me since I left my office. So <laughs> thanks for that. <laughs> uh, so you see, here it is. Uh, can you see it or should so I? What am I looking at? Size? Yes, you are please. Looking one at more. Little more. One more zoom, if you don't mind. Yes. Thank you. Okay. There you are. Now, can you see that uh, this is a description of, you can see Dwarka and Chankhodar. Chankhodar is Beit Dwarka. Can you see where my uh, mouse is? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So this is the part where you have Chankhodar or Beit Dwarka. This is the mainland. Can you see okay. Dwarka here? This is where my... Yeah, and for folks who are listening to this on Spotify and audio only, our apologies. Yes. Um, I, I would offer a solution. I was thinking I could describe what I'm seeing. It's a map. It's a black and white map, but I think you really do need to look at it on video. Because yes. I don't think I will be able to do justice. My, our so apologies guys, in case switch you're to YouTube. enjoying this. But if you're switch jogging, you can check it out later. I understand. I listen to a lot of stuff while jogging as well. <laughs> <laughs> or driving. Yeah. Yeah, just take a look at the map later. Yeah. But roughly speaking, if you imagine the Gulf of Kutch in India, at the rounded bit at the tip is Dwarka. Just off it is Beit Dwarka. And there is a river Gomiti which runs to the mouth yeah. of the place where the, uh, the where only Dwarka thing is, is the way when you zoom in on the Gulf of Kutch, it, there's a little bit of it's like a bit concave. It just, it swoops back on you. Yes. Which is not a bad when you see the full size map of India, but when you zoom down, it's kind of yes. is going backwards in yes. a way. Yes. Only nuance. So uh this is what I wanted to show you that Dwarka was not a very simple place on the mainland. It had mm. an intricate system of creeks and rivers and ridges because it was absolutely on the coast. So that mm -hmm. was the point I wanted to make by showing you this map of ancient Dwarka and ancient Beit Dwarka. Okay. So uh, they went there. They uh, wanted to make a city over there because they wanted protection and they wanted uh, to be very, very safe and secure from the attacks of Magadh. So they chose a place with sea all around. Where is Dwarka? It is sea all around. So nobody hmm. can attack you from that side. And what is at the back of Dwarka? It's hills. So you have hills and you have the sea. And that is how it is also described in the texts. Now there is a okay. description of the tidal waves. In fact, in angles, you know, angul is like this. So in angles, the length, the height of the tidal waves in that place is described in the Harivansh Puran. And today's tidal wave um, studies show great similarities between what is described in the text and the actual tidal wave activity around that area. So that is one of the other reasons. You see, the first reason is that it is next to Raivatak. Dwarka is a place which has been which has been reclaimed from the sea. The third mm. is the pattern of the tidal waves. These are the reasons why we tend to put, I mean, to put the two things together, what is written in the Mahabharat, in the Harivansh Puran, in the Bhagavad Puran, and the actual place where you see it. Then again, Utkarsh, I have had occasion to say this before, that in the study of Indian history, we <coughs> have to look for sources which are not the same as sources for, say, American history, because that's only 200 years. We mm -hmm. have to look at many, many things. So there, is, there are also, you know, folk memories. In fact, S.R. Rao is said to have been, first, his ideas have been developed because of the stories of the people who lived there. 
and the strong stories about the submerging of a city and the stories of their association with krishnji that is why he went there so oral histories in our case are mm, a very mm. very important part of historical investigation and we should definitely not ignore that so what have we right now we have a place which is easy to defend it gives you good shelter it has walls fortifications yep. enclosures and it is built like a port in fact there are also uh, slipways for launching boats etc which is which are built on the shore uh perhaps uh, i should uh, go on to what has been actually found now because we now know the story the yep. end the story of the end of dwarka i will tell you later when we come to the end okay and uh, in case pe uh, people have uh, you know doubts about uh, the identification of this place which with that which is described in the text another thing we will keep in mind is that the topography is also very similar so we have all these reasons to go down there and look for the sunken city of dwarka so that was the reason why we went down there mm -hmm. now what have been the finding so in 1980 <clears throat> national institute of ocean technology it was called something else then started this whole series of expeditions 18 of them were done and in 2000 a very good report on this has come out uh, written by sr rao anybody who really wants to know all the tools which were used because many many uh, new tools and new technology was used you know th uh, things uh, sonar and side sonar and then diving equipment had also improved a lot so that was mm. also used now of course there is also very good underwater photography and it is uh, through underwater photography that a lot of the contours of the floor of the sea or uh, of the floor of any water body can be seen so if anyone wants to know all the technical details marine archaeology by sr rao published in 2000 that's a very good source and a lot of what i'm telling you is drawn from there and also also of course from many other sources so what are the okay. things that we have found over there first thing is that we have found remains of fortifications and walls then okay. we have found things which are called bastions what is a bastion it is a huge stone which serves as a center point and buttresses and holds up entire wall complexes so many of these bastions have been found then uh, stone door sockets pillars many 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 stone anchors there was a very interesting lunate shaped stone which means a moon shaped stone found which is actually found only in hindu temples so a part of that kind of stone was also found over there we have also found one wooden log which is a very very controversial we have found an image of a deity we have found cylindrical perforated jars flag post bases stone built drains fallen walls of a house so what is being built up when i tell you all this what is being built up is the idea of a fortified city these are fortified the fortified hindu city are, yes i mean these okay. yes and in fact i mean uh, since you have said it let me say that it corresponds in so many details to the hindu city as it is described in the arthashastra the okay. fortified city or the durg with fortifications moat both have been found with a central place for the ruler and for his uh, you know <clears throat> courtiers and then hmm. there are also different concentrations of different things in certain quarters in the northern quarter something else is found in the southern quarter something else is found so it seemed as though the city was very very properly organized in six squares and that is the way in which a hindu city is supposed to be organized so all these things which have been found have been are you know kind of referring back to many of the things that we have seen and the things that we can read from the texts which are there with us at but, the moment but if i can just ask you a question there because art shastra as we talked earlier is much later yes so this is the fortified city for sure this is hindu city all the descriptions that you said is there any particular 
evidence or linkage? Is there something described in the text in Dwarka, which you can now find in the evidence that you can see today? Yes. So uh, the thing is, uh, Utkash, when in What's Dwarka, in yeah. In, yeah, uh, when in the Bhagavad Puran or Mahabharat, they describe the city of Dwarka. So they don't describe yeah. ruins. They describe the city. Of course. Of uh, course. So then uh, the, when they describe uh, the city as uh, with a planned town, walls, fort, temple, in the Bhagavad Puran, parks and gardens are mentioned. Then uh, in the Harivansh Puran, some of the houses built by Sri Krishna mentioned. Now, uh, I don't know what kind of evidence would you like? I mean, what kind of evidence would you like or what would convince you? Okay, so let's go two or three ways. One way is specific ar architectural features that we talked about, the difficulty of that, given yes. the time period and the state. Yes. Then there could be, which I'm sure you're going to get into, based on geology, what the timing of that city appears to be. Of course, date of dating, of course, I'm going to get into dates dating. in a bit. Yeah. So yeah. we'll talk about that. And then how does mm. that date triangulate with whatever? We talked about dating the uh, the Mahabharat and other different things. Yeah. Or that particular uh, Basically, we said that it's uh, very tough. And uh, right yeah. now, we're not jumping into it. So you're, So that's since you asked the question, I'm saying that's another way mm. where on one set of information, these set of events are said to be at this way. And there's some evidence that points to it, them being here. And then you have these ruins which have a separate set of evidence pointing them to be of a similar period. Hmm. I'm just saying that's kind of triangulation. But basically my question, the heart of my question is beyond a bias or a bias, but a desire for it to be true. Hmm. What tells us, it is clear that there is a fortified city sunken at the bottom of the, uh, of that uh, sea, ocean. Uh, Arabian over there. Sea. It's clear. Arabian right? Sea, yeah. yeah. Arabian Sea, sorry. Hmm. It's, it's clear. Ocean is Indian Ocean much lower. It's clear that what makes us feel confident that it is indeed Dwarka hmm. as described? That is my question. Hmm. Yes. So for that, like I said, we have a lot of oral history associating hmm. that place with... In fact, you know, today we have the Dwarka Dish temple. That's only about, say, a uh, thousand years old. It's not all that hmm. old. In our scheme hmm. of things, hmm. thousand years is not really all that much. So yep. in so there is a place called Mool Dwarka. That Mool Dwarka has nothing which is old. And that in itself is a great evidence for everything because in the Mahabharata itself is written that Dwarka has been completely destroyed. Okay. Nothing remains. Absolutely nothing remains. So uh, let me come to the end of Dwarka then. Yeah, because yeah, that, also helps, uh, that also helps. That also helps in uh, providing evidence. So in the Mahabharat, what uh, in the Harivansh Puran and in the Mahabharat, the end of Dwarka is described. In the Mahabharat, what uh, they say in the Mosul Parvis, that the sea rushed into the city and Dwarka became just a memory. Oh. In the, yes. And, uh, you know, in the Mahabharat is also said that... Uh, the destruction of Dwarka was foreseen by Krishna. And so all the people of Dwarka were warned that they should move out. So Arjun was the one who went and uh, along with some other Yadav chieftains and leaders, all the people of Dwarka were first moved into, uh, all the people were uh, moved into a safer part where the um, whatever was coming was going to be a little easier to handle. Mm. So uh, let me tell you the exact thing. In the Bhagavad Puran, in the 11th uh, skand, in the 30th Adhyay, there is a set of four lines which describes the portents of doom and what is going to happen to Dwarka. So what did uh, Lord Krishna say? Leave and go to Beit Dwarka to save yourself. So if it is coming from the Arabian Sea, you can go to Beit Dwarka, which is in a bay and which will be a bit safer. Yeah, yeah, go yeah. to Beit Dwarka. Beit Dwarka was called Sankhodar. So go to Beit Dwarka to save yourself or go to Prabhas. Now, if you travel down the coastline of Gujarat, you will find Prabhas. 
So this is what is said by Lord Krishna. So everyone, almost everyone is moved out. And after that, it is what is called, what is written in Sanskrit, it is swallowed by the sea. This is said in the Mahabharat. This is also said in the Bhagavad Puran in the 31st Adhyay. Hmm. Except for Lord Krishna's mansion, everything is swallowed up by the sea. Now, why is this important? Why am I saying it now when you have asked me yeah. for evidence? Yeah. Because this in itself is evidence of the way that this underwater city was destroyed. So uh, S.R. Rao, in his book, when he describes everything that he has found, the remains that he has found, he has actually done a very deep technical analysis to show how mm. the way in which those fallen stones, fallen walls, broken door jams, etc. are there, those mm. are signs of a huge submersion and breaking of that city. Okay. Mm. So this is yet another evidence of why we are to connect it with Tate Dwarka and Dwarka of Mahabharat or Sankoda. Got it. So what you Dwarka. have is physical evidence of a manner in which the city was submerged, yes. which correlates yes. with the, the text and the living memory and sorry, yes. the folk memory, everything yes. that we mentioned. Okay. Yes. I got yes. it. Yeah. And uh, the way in which it is described is, you know, it is like goosebumps. When you read what S.R. Rao writes, what, his, uh, what are the results of that submersion by the sea and the description mm. in the Bhagavad Puran of what is going to happen to Dwarka, it, okay. is, it just gives you goosebumps. But the point to note is that people were warned. So there was okay. no loss of life. Okay. So people were all moved out of Dwarka and the city was completely, completely submerged. Now, I don't know whether there, there are two things which kind of follow on to this. One mm. is that if this place existed, and I've been insisting that it's a seaport. So what's the use of yeah. a seaport? Why make a seaport? Trade. Trade. Yes. So there should have been trade because there is also evidence that there was a slipway. There was a place. It was a port where sh big ships could come in. And there mm. are also stones with holes in them, which show you that huge ropes were used to tie these ships. So what was the use and where were they coming and going? So they were mm. going to, uh, the. Uh, there was a lot of trade with what we call today as the Gulf area, especially Bahrain. Okay. And artifacts what was that area the called back then? And who was there at that point in time? I think, you know, uh, isn't it... Uh, uh, I forget the name of the civilization, but they used to call us Meluha. Oh. They, yes, I they heard used the to term call us Meluha. Meluha somewhere. Yeah, you would the have heard it. It's a, it's, a very, it's a very familiar term. So okay. also, artifacts from here, from India have been found in that area. Very uh, old, in fact, in the same time period, I haven't come to the time period yet, but roughly I can tell you it's about 2000 yeah. BCE. They have been found yeah. over there. Yeah. Another interesting, you know, there was an article in the New Scientist about three months ago about how when the pharaohs in Egypt, when uh, they were mummified, certain perfumes and certain spices and certain uh, substances were used. And... Some of them have newly been traced to India. So you oh, can also make that connection that there was trade with Egypt. Okay. Even at this period of time. Mm. Now, I think we should come to the point of dating. So all these yes. things have been carbon dated. And uh, dating has given a time of about 2000 BCE. So that is about 4000 years ago. Now this 2000 mm. BCE this city, it gives a kind of, uh, you know, uh, date which is co-terminus with the Saraswati Sindhu civilization, with Harappa, Mohanjadaro, Rakhi Gadi, uh, Lothal. Remember mm -hmm. that we are not talking about Lothal, but Lothal is also a very important uh, ancient, perhaps the first seaport in the entire world. We will, and it's okay. also been uh, a lot of it has been submerged, and it's also next to the sea. So we will talk about it sometime. Mm -hmm. So this 2000 BCE is the dating. This links it with what with the late Harappan period. 
the Harappan period, okay. the Saraswati Sindhu civilization period is also divided into many, many parts. And uh, mm. it, it apparently it started 9,000 years ago, the earliest Harappan period. And then the late Harappan period is around, say, 1500 to 2000 BCE. Hmm. So it now relates to that. What have we found that tells us that it is related to the Harappan period? We have found seals with the same script as is there in the other uh, sites of Harappa, Mohanjadaro, Lothal, etc. The same script. Hmm. Hmm. That script is on a conch shell. And it has the motif of a unicorn, which in Sanskrit we call Ekshring, and the motif of a uh, bull. And the motive of a goat. These are standard Indus Valley civilization motives. Sorry, you just threw something very interesting in there. I always thought the unicorn was a European invention. It's it was their Indus Valley civilization. Yes, we don't and talk that... about we don't talk about it much in India. Yes, because you know we don't. Uh, this whole translation is wrong. In the Indus Valley civilization is an animal with one horn over here. Okay. Now this in Sanskrit in Indic terms it's called the Ekashringa, which means one horned. Yes. It has wrongly been translated as this peculiar unicorn that is the product of Western civilization. This Ekashringa has a very deep relation to the philosophy and the iconography of the Indian civilization and of Indic ideas. One day, we will do a podcast only on Ekshring. But for okay. the moment, Ekshring is one horned motif. Let's yes. not, please call it the unicorn. This okay. one horned uh, animal motif, and you know, it's a mixture of uh, the iconography of two animals for certain yes. specific uh, symbolic reasons. This hmm. uh, Ekshring has been found here too in Dwarka. Now, we have already okay. connected Dwarka with the Mahabharat, with the Bhagavad Puran, with the Harivansh. Now, we are connecting it with the Saraswati Sindhu civilization. The Saraswati hmm. river does come in here, you know, because in the Mahabharat, when the Kauras and Pandavas were fighting, Balram, Balram is the elder brother of Sri Krishna. He hmm. was very fond of Duryodhan. He did not want to engage in any fight against Turyodhan. However, he could not bring himself to accept all the wrong things that Turyodhan was doing. So he opted mm. out. When mm. he opted out, what did he do? He started from Dwarka and he went off along the Saraswati River to Patan, which is Prabhas Tirth. This Prabhas Tirth was on the Saraswati River. So you see okay. that this Dwarka a person who lived there is connected to the Saraswati River. The kind of artifacts of which I will tell you more that we are finding in Dwarka are also connected to Harappan civilization. So I've just spoken to you about a seal, image, iconography and script. Mm. The script now, you know, it's a very, very vexed issue, isn't it? No, many people say... We've okay, talked about this, right? That's the, yeah. that's the challenge, right? We've talked about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. You can't decipher so, it, so you can't confirm. Yes. But one person who has, uh, there is someone called uh, NS Raja Ram. Then there is uh, yes. one Mr. Kalyana Raman. So some people are doing it and, and giving you one of the theories regarding what is the meaning of what has been found on that conch seal in Dwarka. Hmm. So one of the meanings is that it says Mahakach. And Mahakach means sea god or sea king. And Mahakacha has been associated with Varun. Remember Varun Devta when we were talking about Sri Ram and the Brahmastra? Yes. So this could be the same Varun Devta. But yes, this okay. is not universally accepted because, you know, the hmm. everybody hmm. is not ready to accept the way in which the script has been understood. Let's leave that aside for the moment. The script is the same as that in the Harappan civilization or the Saraswati Sindhu civilization. The iconography is the same. The okay. dating, the scientific dating is mm. around the time of the late Harappan period. So we have very, very strong links with the Harappan civilization complex. What else have we found? We have found pottery. 
their technical terms are lustrous red wear charcolithic uh, black red wear so these are also late harappan these are also 15th 16th century bce which is the same as around you know 2000 bce we have found inscribed potsherds potsherds are broken pieces of pottery same kind of script is inscribed on them small pieces then we have found the stone seat of a statue we have also found a statue but only up till the legs the upper part is missing mm. so we don't know who it mm -hmm. is because none of the lakshan of any of the bhagwans is visible so we don't know who it is what we have found very interesting is a brass chariot this brass chariot of dwarka and uh, are you going to ask me how come brass where how do you find brass in the second millennium bce so let me tell you that india was the first indian civilization was the first to use brass and indeed in the second millennium bce so this is almost the same as a bronze chariot which has been found in damabad damabad is a saraswati sindhu civilization site the two are very very similar the damabad chariot and the brass chariot of dwarka now chariot remember the chariots of sinoli yes those very chariots of yeah those chariots of sinoli are also associated with the saraswati sindhu civilization so uh, you know in fact some iron nails have also been found dated to the same period but at that time the extraction of iron was not very good so it's a kind of mixture of many different elements and it's not perfect but yes iron nails have also been found and something very interesting you see i'm wearing bangles so who do you think invented bangles the saraswati sindhu civilization and what were the first type of bangles made they were shell bangles and shell bangles are i mean bangles are a gift of indic civilization to the world shell bangles earliest in harappan civilization they have been found in dwarka mm. so i am just giving you all these things to connect dwarka with the harappan civilization and i have already told you about the arthashastra and the shastrik method of planning a city there are really really too many correspondences even in fact to the extent that merchants lived in the southern and other uh, northern uh, parts of the city craftsmen lived in the northern part of the city and the city was laid out in squares of six which mm. you can see even today in the submerged ruins and that is the way in which the arthashastra also describes how a city should be laid out i will put one one of the stylized maps of the arthashastra city if possible there are also the fortified walls the moats the ramparts four doors there are supposed to be four doors in any city four uh, dwars let me call them mm -hmm. not exactly doors entry points huge gates so there are supposed to be four so these are the things which connect dwarka and bet dwarka which i have already i have already connected the two to yeah. the harappan or saraswati sindhu civilization so maybe you should sum up utkarsh so because it's a lot of information okay let me see the takeaways so text wise we already talked about the evidence i mean so what this is what we know what we know is there is a sunken city it bears characteristics of a fortified city Yes. and things that are associated with ancient indian slash hindu uh, yes. cities of that time period uh, and later time is, periods also and, and later time periods also in the text there is a description of what happened to a city which correlates quite well with how it appears that that city got submerged yes secondly when we look beyond that immediate geography itself we we know what is going on in the time period in the whole indian subcontinent we know that about the harappan civilization we know what it looks like what is like iconography we also yes. know about the saraswati sindhu civilization um and we see aspects of them being reflected in this particular physical evidence of the ruins which gives us a lot of confidence that it is associated with said civilizations Absolutely. that's my takeaway yes yes yeah there's Absolutely. nothing i think that no no nothing that i said seems particularly controversial it seems fairly straightforward so far yes yes indeed yeah. indeed it is 
Dwarka should not be treated as anything controversial at all, mm. you know, because all of it stands on very solid evidence. Mm. It stands mm. on a lot of new ways of uh, technology, new technology, which is being used to look at the past. So I don't think there is anything controversial about it at all, at all. Mm. Uh, I had a, another question. I'm sure you were getting into it. So what is the so there are two parts of this basically the question is why did it get submerged yes and there will be two Very ways to answer question. it one is of course what's written in the text which i'm sure you're going to tell us secondly what do we know from a from a geological perspective i don't know if, if you've done enough done, done research on that if you could help look at the answer to this question both perspectives and maybe the two meet at some point it will be very helpful Hmm. Yes. So Utkash, while we were having a, a pre-podcast discussion, you had mentioned the uh, issue of the younger dryastomy. Yes. So then yes. I had already studied a lot of um, a lot of information on why Dwarka was submerged because, I, as you can imagine, for Indians, Indian scientists, this is a very very uh, crucial subject you know not just yeah. because we are interested in the mahabharat or we want to know our past but for the future what's going to happen to the coastline our sea levels going to rise so mm -hmm. yeah. rise or fall of sea levels is of crucial importance to us therefore it has been studied a lot in india now the, yeah. uh, the younger dryas is of course 12900 to 11700 years ago in the uh, holocene period and it yeah, is much, seen to be yeah. No, no, say a very different time period. Very different time period. Yes, yes, but we'll come to that. Uh, this is the uh, this is the Holocene. The Holocene is the one we are living in right now, although uh, people say that now we have already moved into the Anthropocene, which means that we are the ones who are influencing all of climate and all of weather, etc. Mm. But that's a separate mm. issue. Even we want to look at things like why did any coastal city submerge? Why did the sea level rise? Why did it fall? What do we have to look at? We have to look at climate. We have to look at mm. tectonics. We have to look at the effect on these of the sea level. So we look at the coastal environment by, by studying geomorphology, geochronology, and geochemistry. So uh, I have done a bit of the studying for all of you. So I will tell you what the Thank you yes. for that. Because I don't like studying. <laughs> <laughs> so so I, I, I've waded into all this stuff, Utkash. So I, I will tell you what the gist of the matter is. Uh, in India, if we look at the coast that we are considering, the Gujarat coast, hmm. at the end of the last ice age, which is 14,500 years before the present, which is... Uh, uh, you know, it corresponds a bit with the Younger Dryas. What is the Younger Correct. Dryas? It is a period of glacial cooling. So there was yes. a sudden period of glacial cooling when warm climatic conditions kind of receded and everything became very cold. So you see, this is not going to help us in any way because what are we looking for? We are looking for submergence. We are looking for yeah. rise of sea level. So when yeah. glaciation increases, sea levels will not rise. And so yeah. is the case. So the younger dryas has had little effect on the Asian, uh, especially the Indian subcontinent and its western coast. It has had very little effect. Most of the effects have been elsewhere in the northern hemisphere. Oh, I see. I see. Okay. So the younger dryas can be rejected. It's It doesn't in any way add to our solution. So okay. then what do we consider? So we have looked at before uh, the sea levels, the sea levels in the western coast of India, Gujarat coast have been looked at. 14,500 years before the present, they were 100 meters lower than they are today. Then 10,000 years before the present, they were 60 meters lower than they were today, than they are today. But what happened 6,000 years before the present, which is around 3,000 BCE? they started rising. This has been found through scientific studies, geomorphology and quaternary uh, uh, studies. This, has, uh, this is what has been found. Then there is a specific study on 
this area the area of dwarka what happened over there there is also a specific study by it, it's been published by the cambridge university press i will try to link to all these what happens is that uh, one gets so busy that i forget to link all the papers that i mentioned but listeners if you really want to read those papers ask me again in the comments and i will remember and put them because i think um, sometimes some of these things do slip away it's just the two of us so some of these things we don't <laughs> manage to do 100% of the time so these studies suggest that uh, the ice age melt so 11700 years ago the last ice age ended holocene started that ice age melt was not important not i repeat important for yes. us so it was not the reason for the submergence of dwarka it was not at all significant for the gulf of kutch this you can read if you are a technical person you can read in a particular study that i will link mm, mm. so what happened so what their uh, understanding is that it was a question of huge tidal winds which affected that part of the country that part of the coast and tidal what wind tidal winds therefore tidal tsunami winds. or cyclone winds okay, and tides okay. together okay. i got it okay yeah. yeah so it was more probably either a cyclone or a tsunami which was what submerged dwarka this is borne out by what sr rao and his team it's a huge team i am just taking his name but it's a huge team of uh, archaeologists mm. what they have found in the sunken city of dwarka and it is also uh, very similar to the description especially you know the four part four line description that i have uh, talked to you about which was given in the bhagavat puran that there are portents of doom what is going to happen the sea is going to rise up and swallow dwarka and this mm -hmm. is mentioned before it happens so it is an event which happens which is forecast by somebody which is seen you know disaster management is done and uh, disaster prediction is done and people are moved from there mm -hmm. so whatever uh, kind of geographical knowledge we have of you know this is paleo geography obviously we go right back into the past it says that there was a huge tide or a tsunami which engulfed this part of the coast and that okay. is why dwarka was submerged this is not end of the ice age melt this is a one off event a cyclone or a tsunami and such can also be the case for other harappan cities so you know because that's also a big mystery end of harappan cities what happened was there a tectonic shift in the ganga was there a tsunami was there something else so that's also a very big mystery over here most scientific evidence and textual evidence and the remains of dwarka as found under the water are all pointing to the same thing which is a tsunami or a cyclone okay got it okay so it's no no massive global event it's a very localized yes thing. yes 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 correct it's not a global event this one yeah which we are not you know, making because... any statements about any other global events but this yeah, one yeah. was not no at least in the west and again i i apologize if i'm doing injustice to these theories there is the reason i brought up younger dryas of course younger dryas is the freezing but later there is a great melting and a lot of proponents of ancient civilization cite that melting moment as a moment that melted yes. that submerged a lot of cities worldwide yes. correct uh, graham hancock is a big fan yes that and that is why uh, utkarsh i find myself thinking of graham hancock as you know i don't agree with him his ideas are not always uh, they don't correspond to a lot of scientific evidence at least in india i don't know about what he says about other parts mm -hmm. of the world mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. india uh, all of it doesn't seem to kind of match yeah yeah so hence that was my reason for that question but helpful so it's okay sometimes the answers are more mundane than you would expect <laughs> a cyclone is not mundane it is less mundane than global sea levels rising suddenly everywhere 
<laughs> no, that is yeah. also that is also mentioned yeah. in uh, uh, as Pralay. If you want to know about Ice Age melt, we can connect it to Pralay and have a different discussion. Uh, dis that uh, could be a uh, very discussion the podcast episode. Yes, yes. If you should do Ice Age melt versus Pralay. Yes, absolutely. Okay, great. So we we got to that. I wanted to look at look at this point in time. Look at some. Uh, user questions. So there's a question, how and why did cities like Dwarka get submerged? We just talked about it. Was it a natural disaster or could it have been slow global warming? Okay, there's an extension to this question. Legend says that all residents got submerged and died. But what you're saying is that yes. didn't happen. No. Residents did not submerge and die. Residents were actually rescued. Yeah. And so that there is, is a true. very specific uh, description of that rescue in our Purans. Yeah, you know, okay. and it's a very long description. I will uh, refer people who want to read it to, uh, to the eleventh scan, Adhyay thirty and thirty one. Have a long description of how everything happened. How it was seen that this doom is going to happen. How people were moved. How some people went. Mm. How some came back. What happened to Lord mm. Krishna? What happened to his mansion? Mm. And uh, okay. everything is there. Got it. Great. Then we have another question. Specific climate, geomorphological studies of Kutch coastline. You talked about this sea level yes. rise versus ice age and inundation. We just talked about this. Yes. Uh, connected to Mahabharat. I think we've covered that pretty recently. Links with climate change, extreme climate events. I think we talked about this. This is yes. this is not particular to any. It is an extreme climate event for sure, but very localized, yes. is what I would say. Links with Saraswati Sindhu. We have talked. What other questions do we have? I thought we had one oh. on mermaids. Yes, we had because, yeah, this guy, I was ignoring that because it was not Dwarka specific. But yes. <laughs> since we mentioned it and we were planning to do ancient cities and marine archaeology in general, hmm. what do we know about mermaids? Well, so, you know, mermaids are not precisely very Indian. Mermaids have a very uh, Western origin. They come from the Greek mm -hmm. sirens. Earlier, mm -hmm. they used to be birds with uh, the heads of women. Then they became fish. But they, they have a yeah. strong attraction for men. So men are just absolutely fatally attracted to these sirens. The English meaning yeah. of the word siren is also the same today. If you call someone a siren, that person is amazingly attractive that woman to the opposite yes, sex yes. so yes. uh western uh, many many western stories and now the disnification of mermaids is there but uh, if we move to asia there's a very very sweet little indian connect so koreans okay. have a special mermaid who is uh especially near and around busan you know who she is she is the fifth century princess from Ayodhya who came over to Korea to marry the Korean king. Her name was Suri Ratna and, uh, and she was called Hyo Hwang Hok in Korean. And she has been imagined as a mermaid in these Korean stories. So that's the mermaid connection with India. There were links between the kingdoms. in uh, Korea is pretty far away. I get the yes. links with Arabia. No, okay. but you see, there was a very strong trade and uh, cultural and social connect with all of uh, East Asia. Very strong. So you know that uh, the uh, first king of Cambodia was also an Indian. Yeah, Southeast Asia I get because it's close by, closer by. No, but you see Southeast Asia, you go a little up and then you'll reach Korea. And the connections yeah, between all enough. these islands and these places was quite close. Yeah. But anyway, between India and Korea, there were very strong connections. And therefore, this princess went in the fifth century to marry the king. And uh, she has been imagined as a mermaid. And okay. uh, that's a cute Indian connection. Then the other one, which is Indian because it's from the Ramayana, but it is not like India Indian. The Cambodian Thai, Cambodian Ramayana, Thai Ramayana, and other Southeast Asian Ramayans have this uh, beautiful mermaid machli kam woman called a suvanna machcha called she okay. was called suvanna machcha sorry her name was suvanna machcha she was a daughter of ravan the demon king ravan who we know very well yes when hanuman ji was building the ram setu then she tried to distract him and stop him so that the ram setu would not be built 
she did not succeed hmm. however and of course she fell in love with hanuman ji so this is she is a very popular figure in thai folklore and in the cambodian and thai versions of the ramayana so that she is a kind hmm. of you know indian mermaid let's put it that way although in okay. india per se she is not that popular but in india there is an interesting connection with women from the sea so uh, i have hmm. told you often about this uh, story a uh, cluster called the barkaha 6th century bce peshachi prakrit now lost we only have uh, we now have sanskrit tamil marathi hindi etc hmm. versions and uh, yeah. the most uh, famous one is the katha sarit sagar in the katha sarit sagar there are literally hundreds or at least dozens of stories of women who appear in front of ship Uh, ships ocean going vessels so and uh, you know there's a voyage and uh, there's somebody there people who are on a ship suddenly in front of them from the middle of the sea will arise some structure either a mountain or a beautiful huge tree or a complete full city with a number of beautiful women singing and calling out or a beautiful woman <coughs> calling them out and calling them to uh, join uh, the woman on the island or the tree or whatever it is and then when the these soldiers are attracted and they jump and go over there most of them die but sometimes they don't die then they reach that woman and then the whole thing will go down submerge and then there will be a beautiful underwater city and various adventures will befall this soldier and there will be a way to escape from that under water city back to land there will be some shortcut either through a magic well or a magic seat or something or the other so there are umpteen number of stories like this these stories are all like the stories of these mermaids because they attract men they attract men to their doom but they also can lead to great riches what, and great prosperity what do you think is the what is the inspiration for these stories in real life if i could ask you that yes it, what's your theory yes uh, my theory is that a lot of indian people went to uh, ship go uh, ocean going vessels on ships and they went to east asia and southeast asia they obviously you yeah. know they went there to trade and they saw beautiful cities rich cities beautiful women and trade mm. commerce and sea going was a kind of metaphor for attaining all the things that you want in life prosperity okay. beautiful women wonderful place to stay all these things were got through obtained through these sea voyages okay. and women were a, well women are always a very integral part of all this you know to attract men there are always women in every story and it also happens yeah. to be true because so many of these merchants went there uh they had trade commerce and they became very rich people they married local girls and then they came mm. back very rich however many of them also you know died in the process so i mm. think that this is a metaphor for ocean going trade and for interactions between india and southeast asian countries east asian countries which brought them a lot of prosperity that's my story for and i i feel that a, a lot of the stories of mermaids even in the mm. west are affected by these same issues and the same things and you know this mm. bad kaha this katha sarit sagar is a story complex which has spread across the world i'm sure uh, you would be interested to know that some of shakespeare's plots are from this katha sarit sagar another episode Yes. in the making <laughs> and that will be one of my favorite episodes because the way these stories have gone everywhere is just crazy so the arabian so nights is the original romeo and juliet no romeo and juliet is not the romeo and juliet is such a very i don't know uh, it, it's not an indian story utkarsh it's not an indian story really okay which one is as a quick preview so uh, as you like it is uh, okay. directly from and there's a very clear path that is traced from the badkaha to the katha sarit sagar and to how it went to italy and then from how it went how it went to england there's a very clear source a clear uh, almost okay. documentation okay so these stories okay. have spread everywhere 
So I wouldn't be surprised if the Greek ideas of mermaids were influenced by these stories because you know the way they appear in the mm -hmm. sea is exactly mm -hmm. the same, and mm -hmm. the kind of events which follow are exactly the same. The difference is that the Indian ones don't have a fish tail. <laughs> That's the difference. They are women, as in women. But yes, they can yeah. turn into other things also. Sometimes fish, mm -hmm. sometimes other things, but they don't mm -hmm. have fish tails. Mm -hmm. But mermaids yeah. are, for me, trade and prosperity. But the dangers which are attached to trade and prosperity also. Mm -hmm. Okay, wonderful. Great. I have lost myself in this in these underwater cities. How long has it been, Karsh? I think it's been an appropriate amount of time to consider. Okay. <laughs> I like that appropriate amount of time. <laughs> no, but great. So this was good. I'm sure that just for the last question, and then we can end this. So, what is there ongoing work on Dwarka? Is there work? I mean, I'm sure there is. Uh, so, what should we be expecting in the coming years? What are what are people? I working think on? what we will idea? expect is I think uh, technology is improving. So uh -huh. uh, we will be able to explore better. We are getting better images. We are able to actually see in inverted commas these mm. underwater structures much better and understand them much better. So I am okay. expecting much many many more discoveries in terms of structures uh, underwater, in terms of their dating, and in terms of their connections with what we already know. So. Till about the 80s, nobody thought that whatever was written in the Mahabharat or in the Bhagavad Puran would, would actually be found. Now we found it. Mm -hmm. And there is, of course, uh, another uh, archaeologist, B.B. Lal, who we should not forget. He has done a lot of work in this area of finding things connected to the Mahabharat and to the Ramayana. So he has done a lot of work yeah. in this area. But I expect a greater spate of discoveries, which will in the end, tell us that there was no different Vedic civilization and Harappan civilization, but that the two were the same. And we will get scientific evidence on land, on sea, under sea, to bolster this theory. Okay. okay. And uh, Utkarsh, again, uh, we've uh, spent too much time on this, but otherwise we have to do that other Gulf of Khambat city also. Or maybe just make yeah. a short clip on it because this is already too long. So we must do yeah. something on we'll that. We come back also. to it because this, yeah. I think you again just crashed the surface in terms of ancient lost cities, submerged cities. There's a lot. You know, more to it is said that it is because of the submerged island of Dwarka that the entire myth of Atlantis, of Atlantis. The stories of Atlantis, started. Yes. 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 Indeed, and I think what we can probably do is do Atl We can do these other cities, including some Western myths. Those are myths. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Uh, in another episode. Yes, we can. And yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah. Good. So good. We'll end it here. Again, folks, thank you for joining. Anything else to add? No, no. Or... I just wanted to tell all our viewers that uh, I am going to take a two-week break. So there's going to be a bit of a break. Hopefully not, Utkash. Next week, we will release this episode. And the week after that, maybe a few clips. Yes, we'll be having regular service with the clips. And there's so much information in there. I know a lot of you have seen a lot of the podcasts, but now that we are about 20 episodes in, there are literally nuggets of information hiding everywhere. So I will endeavor to get them out in more accessible forms for you to check out. Yes. So I hope to see you after my return with some other very sizzling topic. And thank you so much for responding to the questions. That's also a lot of fun. Yes. Wonderful. All right. Take care. See you next time. Namaskar. See you again.